and we're going to basically take you through um, an introduction to um, our views of uh, rural Canada, what homelessness looks like in rural Canada, and then I will turn over the microphone to Alina, and she will um, move you along through what uh, some of our findings and our recommendations are. So the first thing that we did in looking at this was to try to describe what rural homelessness would look like. And it doesn't look like what we uh, traditionally envision uh, as homelessness in um, urban settings. And otherwise, we don't have people congregating around shelters or sleeping in, uh, in doorways. But what we have is we have people sleeping in places that are not usually considered fit for human habitation. Um, such as you see here in a cold, snowy uh, Canadian winter. Um, we have people who are living, this is a little more decrepit than, but it's meant to make a statement, this slide does, um, of the fact that there are a lot of people who are living in um, homes um, that um, fall well below uh, what we ha currently have as an acceptable uh, housing standard. So that these are houses that may be filled with mold, um, they may have structural uh, damage, um, they may not be uh, safe from the elements, um, they may be in hidden and out of the way locations. Uh, people also um, are found to be sleeping in campers and recreational vehicles. Um, and this occurs an awful lot in uh, areas where uh, there's been a perhaps an economic boom and there is absolutely uh, no affordable housing to be had. And it often not only impacts the um, higher paid workers who usually have fairly good recreational vehicles to sleep in, but it also accommodate, uh, includes people um, at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale who, um, who find that they can no longer afford rental uh, property in their local community. We also find that people are provisionally accommodated often in uh, uh, homeless shelters for uh, domestic violence, um, but they're also uh, couch surfing and they're doubled up. They're insecurely housed uh, because they can no longer um, afford the rent. Um, they may be temporarily living with, um, with, with family members or friends because of, uh, of domestic violence or uh, or lack of um, suitable housing, um, or they may have found um, other ways to try to seek shelter from the elements. Some of the images that you see here, um, we're up to um, uh, slide 10, um, really look at um, rural environments and First Nation environments. We did not specifically in this uh, study uh, look at um, rural homelessness within Aboriginal reserves. It's a really a, an extremely important, but we saw this as a separate area. The entire focus of the study was to look at whether or not a housing first approach would work uh, in rural environments. But as I said, the first thing that we had to do was to define um, what these rural environments would be. The um, so here, as we move on to a study overview, we set out to explore what the state of homelessness was in rural communities and then to uh, further try to identify whether a housing first approach might be a viable um, way of addressing homelessness in these uh, rural and small towns. Um, so our sample community had a population under 25,000. Uh, we chose this because it's a D marker that is used in a number of, uh, of different uh, demographic studies and it fit well with our overall profile of wanting to stay away from largely urbanized areas and to really address rural. We also found that quite a number of our rural communities really had populations that ranged uh, usually under 7,500 people. So we're talking more and more small towns. The hamlets of uh, 500 or less um, were not a specific focus of this study, but we recognize that homelessness when it in rural communities can span um, various sizes and uh, then various 
uh, complex demographic makeups. Um, we wanted to look at emerging homeless trends, particularly regarding um, migration, uh, migration of, uh, of workers for economic reasons, uh, migration of uh, immigrants perhaps between their port of landing and where they will ultimately uh, settle. Uh, we wanted to look at the macroeconomic impacts and the population specific issues and, and what I mean by that is that uh, there are areas where there has been considerable um, investment in the energy sector, certainly out west in oil and gas, but you even find that um, out in uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, parts of northern Quebec, uh, so that the energy sector is a, a major um, influence uh, as it brings in uh, skilled workers and also uh, support workers um, to build up this, uh, this infrastructure. Uh, we are also became aware of and wanted to look at the population specific uh, uh, issues that is the extent to which um, Aboriginal people who were not living on a reserve but chose not to be in a large city um, were impacting um, homelessness and housing issues in small towns. Uh, the extent to which youth um, were impacted by homelessness. Uh, there had been some uh, research studies in some communities on this and this is of uh, particular concern across the country. Um, and lastly and importantly, whether or not um, mental health and addictions uh, played the same kind of uh, role and significant role in uh, uh, rural communities as it uh, uh, appears to have in um, urban areas. We also wanted to look at the local service and housing continuum and try to uh, uh, determine to what extent there was a, uh, a service system continuum um, and uh, whether uh, local communities were aware of emerging needs and had any um, plans to begin to address these um, emerging needs and uh, that also meant the extent to which communities uh, were aware of homelessness as an issue in their community. Most uh, admitted to it but there were some communities that, that we either were not aware or not willing to look at that issue um, and also within that context whether or not there was an understanding of what housing first initiatives were all about and whether or not um, people in uh, their communities saw a, um, a way that um, housing first uh, could be implemented. Okay, so a note about housing first because they, one of the things that we found uh, uh, in our scan across 22 communities spanning uh, uh, from east to west coast and north to south was that there was a, um, a real variation in the way that people understood housing first and the way that they saw that it either could or could not be applied within their community. And so what we talk about when we're uh, talk about uh, mention housing first is that we uh, see it both as an approach to providing immediate shelter for homeless people um, before requiring uh, uh, treatment and abstinence, and we're talking about abstinence from alcohol and the uh, and substances. In other words, the idea being that people will be housed regardless of whether or not they have an active mental health or, or an addiction issue, regardless of whether or not they're receiving treatment, that these are not conditions for housing, that, that housing is a right, and that people may choose um, to opt into a treatment program after they're housed, but that this is a choice and their housing is not predicated on that choice. The other way that Housing First is described is as a very specific program that has um, uh, at this point I think 38 different criteria that have been attached to it. It's a program model developed um, in New York City by an organization called Pathways to Housing um, and it has had quite uh, a bit of success in housing people who are absolutely homeless and who've been taken from the shelters and off the streets uh, of major cities. Um, that particular program model requires a uh, or has used an ACT team and a sort of community treatment team consisting of 
um, psychiatrists, psychiatric nurses, psychologists, social workers, rehabilitation counselors, addiction counselors to work with people um, at their choosing after they've been housed. Um, the program has also evolved to include an intensive case management um, uh, approach, uh, which involves using case managers as the primary contact people. But again, the uh, the idea is that um, individuals who are housed are provided with uh, a intensive support services so that they can um, get uh, reestablished in permanent housing and. Uh, they can then look at whatever additional support issues they want. So we have Housing First as a program or and then what we call either an approach or a paradigm. Um, and Elena will talk in a few minutes a little bit more about um, what some of the reactions were across uh, the country to, um, to Housing First. So the communities that participated uh, ranged from uh, Camrose in Alberta, Chicoutimi in Quebec, Cochrane, um, Estevan, Saskatchewan, Happy Valley Goose Bay in Labrador, Equalicut, Kenora in Ontario, New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, Old Crow in the Yukon, Pincher Creek in Alberta, uh, Point Lacroix in Quebec, Revelstoke in British Columbia, Rocky Mountain House in Alberta, um, and I'll explain rural Newfoundland in a minute and rural Atlantic area, rural southeast uh, New Brunswick, uh, Smithers, BC, Saint Adele, Quebec, Steinbach, Manitoba, Wellington County, Ontario, Whitehorse in the Yukon, and Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. So let me go back for a minute and explain where these areas came from. Rural Newfoundland um, has established a, um, a housing support worker program. It has divided um, into uh, seven different uh, regions, and each of these regions has a um, housing support worker attached to it. So we actually met with the provincial uh, people who guided that particular uh, program in setting it up. Some of the um, some of the communities that we uh, interviewed um, happened to be it was snowball. It was a convenient sample. Other communities were purposely picked out. Uh, the communities in Quebec um, were actually interviewed in French. We had a French. Uh, French-speaking uh, research assistant who was able to help us out and did an absolutely wonderful job. Uh, so we we do not claim in uh, this particular sample to have adequately sampled the entire country, but we've got a broad brush stroke of what people in different areas are reporting. And uh, these communities varied in their uh, socioeconomic um, status and the impact of uh, of any other kinds of um, uh, outsider economic influences um, so that uh, and some of them especially out in the Alberta and BC area um, are also influenced by the economics of the tourist industry okay so what were our limitations some of the limitations for this um, study were that we used a very short um, window of opportunity. We basically collected our data from uh, uh, from late fall into early winter, so that our data collection was uh, uh, basically finished by, I believe, about Christmas time. Uh, that has its strengths and its weaknesses. Uh, the strength of that time limitation was that we caught all of our interviewers at about the same point in time, both in terms of climate, but uh, it, it, and, and I'm talking about the weather, which influences the way that we perceive business. It's harder to think of homelessness in rural areas when everything is green and very sunny. Uh, than it is when it is icy cold and, and, and brutal in, in January. Um, it also meant that uh, we were catching um, everyone at about the same period of time in terms of the local political climate. It did mean um, that we were limited with how many communities that we could look at, um, how many people in the communities we could look at, um, that we had to rely on key informant reports um, and uh, that um, 
we had to, at the end of the day, uh, acknowledge that um, in order to have a definitive idea of what rural homelessness is, we really need to do perhaps a, a larger, more in-depth study. But this is, when we looked at all of the literature on rural homelessness, we could not find anywhere um, in either the gray literature or the academic literature reports that really spanned across the country. So this was a first, this was a beginning, this was a first stab at what is rural homelessness when we look across Canada. Um, our recruitment process was also limited at this point to those willing and available to participate in a uh, very short uh, period of time. Uh, for some people um, who felt that they had uh, to um, get clearance from, uh, from their uh, local uh, senior reporting um, people, um, this often meant that they were not able to respond as quickly as uh, this particular project uh, would have been ideal to do. Uh, let me see. So, challenges. Um, one of the, uh, the challenges was the tremendous variation in community size, the location, and the degree of remoteness. I, again, uh, as we recognize how vast this country is, um, there is no adequate way if we're looking at from a statistical point of view or even from a qualitative point of view in terms of saturation, I don't believe that we saturated our um, pool of respondents in terms of how many would have been ideal to really understand homelessness in any particular um, in any particular kind of configuration. But we did get a much better understanding of the uh, some of the parameters of homelessness. Uh, the communities uh, ranged in awareness and recognition of homeless issues from complete denial, as I've mentioned before, complete denial of a problem, to feeling absolutely overwhelmed. There were some communities who reported that they just had a homeless problem, they didn't know what to do about it, um, they felt that they had a lack of resources, the, and, and so uh, we had this huge range again. Um, we found out fairly quickly that communities that are located close to reserves experience a significant flow into town of Aboriginal people seeking housing. And so one of the things this pointed out to us and, and made clear was that just because someone is leaving the reserve doesn't mean that they necessarily want to go um, into a, to a larger city. Some do, but many go to a larger city because there are there is no place in between the reserve and the city where they feel welcome. Uh, and so there is this inherent um, kind of just underneath the surface uh, racism that a lot of Aboriginal people continue to experience in rural areas. Um, the small towns don't have the accommodation for them and they often seek and need uh, some additional services that are just not available in the rural communities. Some communities rely on larger neighbors to supply the necessary emergency services. How much of this reliance is based on an, in, um, an, an unwillingness to provide the services and how much of this is based on an, an inaffordability? In other words, these small communities really don't have the financial resources to provide these services, nor do they have the person power to um, to step in and, um, and and address the need. So this speaks to um, the whole attention and dynamic between what is a local responsibility, what is a provincial responsibility, and what is a res federal responsibility for housing and for support services. So that basically is a brief overview of uh, what the uh, what the study involved, and uh, just to go one step further with that. So what we did uh, was we did most of these as telephone-based interviews. In um, some cases, because of convenience, we were able in several uh, instances to have face-to-face uh, -face conversations. Uh, ideally, uh, that provides a a, a really a, a a better way in some ways, uh, and a more holistic way of collecting the data. Um, but the reality also is that uh, 
this uh, when you're looking across Canada to visit all of these rural uh, locations would have been logistically impossible. So I will now turn it over to um, Alina. I bring you to slide 16, which reminds us of the, the vastness um, of uh, uh, the, the vastness uh, of this uh, project. Alina. Hi everybody, thanks so much for, um, for coming in on this call today and thanks for the hub for hosting this as well. Um, so I'm going to take you through some of the findings of the study and some of them echo very much what Jeanette was uh, presenting as well. So um, with that being said, I do want to make the point that rural homelessness from what we found is uh, quite distinct and has very unique dynamics we compared to what we know about ur urban regions in particular in Canada. So I'm going to take you through some of the um, those unique dynamics and um, starting with one of the trends that we found being that um, homelessness is reported to actually be on the rise across the country. So that's something that um, we didn't necessarily expect when we started the work. Um, and there's obviously something happening in the uh, um, overall, um, I guess, macroeconomic environment that is prompting homelessness to um, emerge as a significant social issue across rural communities. Now, the trick with that um, point about the rise of ho perceived homelessness or real homelessness is that we were relying on people's observations and reports of this particular trend. And what we actually found was that there was very little um, actual um, data available across the country on enumerating homelessness in a, any systematic fashion. So um, when we looked at uh, communities across the country and asked for you know, evidence of um, backing up the, the numbers, for example, that, that evidence was often informal or something that um, staff kept track of in a, you know, a one-off basis, but um, unfortunately they, there wasn't this, this systematic way of collecting the data. So and when we say homelessness is reported to be on the rise, we mean just that. It's, um, it's reported by community-based um, representatives that we interviewed to actually get a sense of the numbers and to see where, where the trends are showing an increase um, is, is something that was beyond the, the ability of the study to, to truly probe in detail. So um, I'll, I'll make that note because when we come to recommendations, that's, that's an area that we need further work on from a research perspective. Um, in terms of, okay. Um, can everybody still see my screen? I just had something pop up. Okay. All right, hopefully this works. So the other point that Jeanette uh, made as well is that homelessness in rural communities is primarily hidden. So um, that's, you know, the notion of people doubling up with families and friends and couch surfing. Uh, that's what makes um, the phenomenon quite a bit hard to get a handle off in terms of in terms of trends as well because you're not necessarily seeing people in emergency shelter in, or on the street. Nevertheless, what we also heard from communities across the country is that um, visible forms of homelessness and sleeping rough were actually common as well. So, you know, Jeanette mentioned warmer weather and, and people um, um, not necessarily being as aware about homelessness, but on the other hand, we also have reports of um, people sleeping in, in small town parks and, and being visible um, during the summer months. So um, there's, this, there's that dynamic happening as well that, again, we often associate with urban centers and the, the visible chronic homeless, uh, but it seems to be also happening in, in rural communities as well. The other thing that was interesting as well um, was that there were a consistent number of chronically homeless individuals reported across the communities, which means that you know you might have your majority of your population that is hidden and um, homeless due to economic reasons and primarily, but there's still this small segment of maybe one, two, three people uh, that are reported to be long-term homeless with um, the additional barriers of mental health and addictions um, with with that housing instability combined. So that's, again, something that 
uh, we didn't necessarily expect going in. And rural homelessness is, if anything, is is usually associated with lower acuity populations and, and families and uh, people that are facing rough economic times. But while that might be true for some, there is this additional dynamic of, and this small segment that is experiencing more complex needs. Um, in terms of migration and Aboriginal migration in particular, um, you heard from Jeanette around the proximity to um, reserves and that impacting flow of Aboriginal people into rural centers. And that's again something that was um, very kind of an interesting finding because we are often um, told in the literature about uh, Aboriginal people migrating into urban centers. And by urban centers, we mean the, the big cities. Uh, but we actually found that a lot of migration is happening within rural regions for uh, similar reasons, people seeking access to services, employment and education opportunities. Um, in some cases, uh, women fleeing violence um, in their home communities were reported to seek um, assistance from domestic violence services in, in a rural setting. And so um, we definitely can't assume that that migration is uh, in one direction only, or which is the big city, it's happening within regions as well. I also wanted to make a point about some subpopulations that emerged, not necessarily in all the 22 communities, but um, there were uh, mentions about youth becoming a, um, a group of um, growing, con that the communities were having growing concern about. So uh, whether the youth were um, fleeing abusive homes, or they were um, attributed to be more transient, right, quote unquote. Um, women fleeing violence, that was quite consistent across the country, that that was a major driver for um, people seeking services. And in of, oftentimes, um, rural communities don't necessarily have emergency uh, shelter for women and their children fleeing violence. So uh, that might create the migration strategy to seek services where they're available is, is often the, the only choice available in, in this instance. Families we, we chatted about as well, and um, seniors. This is actually something that came up when in Alberta communities we, uh, we looked at, and this is the issue of um, a senior's housing accessibility becoming, becoming an issue for them to maintain um, housing stability long term. So being on fixed income, but um, facing additional health issues and not being able to um, address that to stay in place and age in place, um, it's probably going to become a, a more substantial trend moving forward. So it's not that we're seeing seniors that are becoming absolutely homeless, but we are hearing reports about housing stress for seniors in rural communities. And if you think about it from a transportation angle as well, um, accessibility, not just being about housing, but the transportation to to access services and, and um, physical health um, needs that a senior might have, that becomes a major limiting factor. And then newcomers, again, not something that was reported across the board, uh, where we see areas of economic growth that rely on migration and international migration, temporary foreign workers. Again, it's not just something that we see in, in Calgary or uh, Edmonton, Vancouver, uh, Toronto. It's it's something that's happening in, in rural communities as well. And so the same struggles that a newcomer might face in terms of accessing income supports and having eligibility for um, rent supports, et cetera, is impacted by their legal status in Canada. In rural centers, that's often even more magnified because you might not even have um, a, a local government office where you can take your case forward and, and uh, um, advocate for your, your benefits as well. So there's, uh, there are reports of newcomers um, experiencing hidden homelessness and doubling up in, in housing structures that are definitely not fit for the amount of people that are, that are living within them. So um, that's something that, again, we need to watch, especially with increasing migration and the focus on um, temporary migrants is to fuel our continued economic growth. And so if that's something that's going to become part of our rural strategy moving forward, you know, what does that mean for from a housing and social infrastructure perspective? So just a couple of things that, that emerge from, from the work. Um, 
the other piece that we wanted to emphasize in, in our study is um, understanding the, the local responses to um, homelessness trends that were reported. So we asked people, you know, what it, does your continuum of services look like? What's the community doing to address this issue? Um, by far, or, yeah, the most common response was we're looking at an emergency shelter or we have a food bank or a soup kitchen. So that seemed to be kind of the go-to um, response, and that's understandable. It's, it's about meeting basic needs. Um, where things got a little bit more complicated is when we asked about coordination on um, and strategies to address homelessness that are community-wide as opposed to one-off uh, programs and, and services. And that um, varied quite a bit across the communities and depended largely on um, available funding and resources. And different jurisdictions place different emphasis on homelessness responses, and different jurisdictions have varying levels of support available to address rural homelessness in particular. So again, that's that's something we, we saw across the board, whether it was Ontario or, or Alberta, who have a commitment to ending homelessness, at, at least in, in theory at the provincial level, uh, funding didn't necessarily flow through into rural communities in those cases, which meant that um, as, to the best of their abilities, communities could respond with um, donations and informal supports, um, leveraging what they had in place already through municipal or, or town councils, and um, you know, trying to make try to make it work to respond, but there, without that formalized uh, resource base, it was quite difficult to create a coordinated response in, at the rural level. The other piece that impacted that as well was the affordable housing available and rent supports that were accessible within rural centers. So um, again, most government programs focus those resources where the need is, and from a you know, wider big picture perspective, the issue is by far uh, most experienced in urban centers, which means funding tends to flow in that direction, even just using population-based formu formulas. Um, however, that um, also results in this uneven distribution and continued investment in urban centers um, where we clearly have a need in, in smaller centers as well. That, interestingly, um, fueled that migration into urban centers, right? So we hear consistently from um, these communities that if you need access to affordable housing or social housing or um, mental health support, addiction support, you have to migrate. You have to access those somewhere else. So, um, you know, whether that's an intentional response or, or is that the right response, is there a way that we can balance uh, so that people can stay within their communities and, um, and not necessarily have to to leave to access emergency shelter, for example. That's something that we need to be um, a lot more mindful about in, in future social planning, I would suggest. So here's a, a picture of a, uh, what supportive housing um, looks like in the rural level. I'm sure you guys have all driven down main streets in, in, in small communities and seen these um, old hotels. Um, in this case, it was um, converted into a um, single room occupancy supportive housing project. Um, I mentioned the, the funding impact and I wanted to make a note of on HPS in, in particular, the homelessness partnering strategy. Um, and that is that community designation, so being one of the 61 communities, um, and some of the communities we interviewed met that designation status, but also were rural because they were, their populations were under 25,000. So it was an interesting comparison between those and those that did not have HPS designation. Where HPS designation was in place, we did hear reports of uh, much more coordination happening and, and much more um, of a collaborative effort in place to address homelessness. And that, I think that's probably because of the, the requirements of uh, collaborative planning that comes through HPS funds and you know the need to have a community advisory board in place that represents diverse stakeholders, the need for um, community priorities to become determined and, and reviewed on a yearly basis, and, and uh, that focused on creating a continuum of, of services and community. So even though there wasn't much in terms of actual dollars coming through HPS, those 
small amount of dollars came with um, this kind of prompt to collaborate and coordinate, and that created um, much more likelihood for that infrastructure of um, of coordination to to at least be there in in spirit and uh, in, you know and have some formalized mechanisms as well. Um, I mentioned the uh, provincial, federal, and local funding being quite um, variable across the country. And I mean, one of the examples is that we heard from Ontario was um, how government was um, asking communities to develop plans to end homelessness. Um, however, there weren't any resources that were allocated to support the implementation of the plan. So, um, you know, that definitely hampers efforts and hampers um, kind of buy-in at the local level to, um, to move in, in that direction. Um, there was also a lot of, um, um, I guess, questions about securing funding, and uh, people often talked about having access to HPS and, and that being a valuable resource, but in many cases, it was also reported that um, communities applied for HPS funds and weren't successful. So um, we didn't explore in depth what, you know, what occurred, because that was outside of the scope of what we were looking at, but um, there does seem to be this, this sentiment that there has to be, a, a, I guess, better communication and transparency in, in terms of being eligible for, for funds. And this is not just to do with HPS funds. It's, um, there was questions about provincial funding. And, um, and you can see how that can emerge when you have so many communities that, that are rural and, and have this issue, but the funding stream is not um, necessarily um, accessed by all of them. In, a, in what they feel to be an equitable manner, then that can definitely create some, some tension. So in terms of Housing First feasibility, uh, what we heard across the board is that um, first people were mostly familiar with the Housing First notion, um, but when we actually got into uh, conversations about what they thought it meant in practice and whether they were interested in implementing Housing First initiatives in the rural context, uh, notable um, challenges were emerged. So first is the lack of funding for implementation. These are not cheap initiatives. And when you have uh, very limited access to uh, funds to support social initiatives overall, so that, that includes daycare or seniors programs, et cetera, um, how do you justify um, allocating such a large amount of funds to homelessness? So that Again, that co competition f of funding and, and among social issues and, and social priorities at the rural level um, really emerged um, probably much more so than we would expect in, a, in an urban center because there's, there's much more um, availability of diverse funding streams where you can tap into. In rural centers, you, you don't have that um, choice necessarily. The other challenge was the availability of clinical experts to, um, to actually staff Housing First initiatives. So if you think about the ACT model or intensive case management, um, attracting qualified staff to deliver those services in a rural setting, I mean, these are communities that don't even have a family doctor in, in some cases. So that, again, was, was another uh, stumbling block moving forward. Another one was the housing stock available for scattered site approaches, and that's related to the landlord buy-in issue. And so if you guys are familiar with rent, uh, with rental market um, dynamics and, and small centers, you know, sometimes there is no um, actual uh, rental stock to speak of, which means that um, the rental stock might be uh, somebody owning a house and renting it out as a one-off, so it's, it's more informal. Um, there aren't necessarily apartment buildings or multifamily uh, development available on the in the rental um, universe within these communities so that's number one um, of an issue the second is where you do have um, private rental stock in place landlords um, where there's maybe one or two of them in one community there was one landlord that owned all the properties and he wasn't on board with rehousing chronically homeless individuals and there was nothing the community could, could do to convince them otherwise. So they were effectively blocked from uh, implementing scattered site approaches by this individual. So, you know, how do you implement housing first that relies on scattered site um, housing when you're, 
just not able to access any in your community. So not to say that it's not possible, I'm just uh, letting you know what, what some of the, the real life challenges were that, that people reported. The other one is to do um, with the cost um, of actually implementing these types of programs in small centers. So like, like I mentioned before, if you've got one or two chronically homeless people in a community and another one or two in another community, you know, 60 kilometers away, um, are you going to create a program for each of those? And that would become very cost prohibitive. And so um, because there wasn't necessarily a regionalized approach to delivering um, programs in some of these localities, they, they couldn't they couldn't uh, really figure out how to implement when they, there wasn't enough demand to merit full-scale implementation of a program. So that's not to say that there aren't other options. It's just uh, um, that's something that was identified as, as an issue to be overcome. And then transportation challenges, as I, uh, as I mentioned before, um, these communities don't necessarily have public transportation, buses, taxis, etc. So um, even if you um, manage to locate scattered site housing um, outside of the, the core, uh, how do people get to work and um, how do people um, get back to their, their social network that, that might not necessarily be where, where their housing unit is. And the communities are, are just much more spread out as well. So uh, that becomes a, another challenge. So here's some more um, issues that we, uh, we heard in terms of housing first implementation. So some people felt that they were already doing housing first. So they would, they would point to a transitional housing program they had in place and say, this transitional housing program shows our implementation of housing first. Um, when, and of course, that's, a, that's not what housing first is. But there was um, this tendency in, in some communities to equate housing first with the traditional continuum model, so moving from emergency shelter to transitional housing to, to permanent housing in, in the end. So um, it, it really showed that even though people might have heard about housing first, they weren't necessarily um, you know, fully aware of its principles and, um, and its actual implementation uh, philosophy. And um, so that definitely points to the need to do much more um, education targeted across Canada on, on what Housing First is. And the other piece that we heard is, um, you know, and it's, I guess it's another challenge in, the, in implementation is that people said, well, we don't just accept anyone. So we accept people that show that they're um, ready for housing, et cetera. And it, it points, it's the same point as, as, as above, as the understanding of Housing First wasn't necessarily a harm reduction, low barrier understanding. And so even though people were quite interested in it, uh, when we probed a little bit further, we, we thought there was, there was just some, some major work to, to be done uh, in terms of getting buy-in on, on those low barrier principles. Um, the other issue that emerged was um, around risks of taking on housing first. And especially with the focus on chronically and episodically homeless uh, clients with uh, relatively high barriers that are not necessarily the first choice of, uh, of some programs, um, people have to deal with different um, risks. So client and staff safety, especially if you're placing clients in scattered site apartments and um, work, working with private landlords. You're going to have critical incidents. You're going to have fights, fires, etc. Um, so, what are what are the training and protocols and staff support and training that you need to have in place to mitigate that moving forward? And so, that's just not necessarily something that people were willing, interested, or, or able to take on. It's um, it's just an, another part of their implementation challenges in in these smaller centers. Um, and then the new versus old streams. It's, that's just a, a point about some of the shifts around HPS and as well provincially in, in some communities, there's a renewed focus on housing first and ending homelessness. Um, but um, there's, there's still this need for long-term um, sustainability and um, there's concern around, for example, HPS's requirements to, um, to have access to provincial funds to, to ensure sustainability long-term be, beyond 2019. And that's not necessarily, um, or that's seen as a, a risk in some communities because they, they feel like they may be left holding the bag after 2019. And I'm pretty sure that's not something that's unique to uh, 
to rural communities, though. It's probably across of Canada concern around HPS funding. So um, a couple more points for rural realities, and um, I've probably made these already, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, move them quite quickly to get to the solutions. So most have no emergency shelters available um, to speak of, so that's just a, some, a reality that we can't necessarily expect to build housing first responses where um, the social infrastructure is not really what we would expect in, in an urban center to be. So support services are minimal or non-existent in some places. There's a significant lack of system-wide cooperative efforts. So not that people are not willing, it's just that infrastructure is not necessarily there. The official recognition, um, which Jeanette already mentioned, so if the uh, county and is not um, supportive or, or even recognizing um, that homelessness is an issue, then it makes it really tough to argue for resources to be allocated to it. Um, there's this lack of regionalized response to address rural homelessness, so, uh, and that, of course, impacts funding as well. So again, if um, your higher orders of government don't have placed priority on rural homelessness, then um, funding's not necessarily going to flow through to support initiatives at the local level. So the lack of funding, like I mentioned before, the lack of access to units, again, and the challenge of hiring program staff, especially those in the medical field. Okay, so housing first adaptation. So having said all that about challenges, there is innovative work happening, and not just in Canada, but around the world, around uh, rural house, housing first um, implementation. Um, what I've found um, in, in my work, and uh, what Jeanette has also seen in, um, in her work on, on adaptations of, of housing first in, in other communities as well, is that this ability to leverage existing community resources to deliver the functions of housing first, uh, which includes case management, housing location, rent supports, and permanent housing, um, that seems to be the, the kind of the key to unlocking some of this, the rural uh, community potential around adapting housing first, which means that we can't just plop a an ACT program in, in a rural community and, and expect it to work because of the rural realities that we mentioned before. However, if you look at each um, community on its own merit and you see some of the resources they might have in place already, is there, if you think about leveraging them and tweaking them to meet the intent of Housing First, uh, you might have a, a better chance of, um, of introducing some innovative adaptations. Um, the other piece that we found as well is this a notion of regional implementation, leveraging um, resources across rural communities. So not just focusing on one community at a time, but looking at a region and seeing what the potentials might be um, leveraging resources across communities. So um, we won't have a chance to go through all of these um, pieces, but uh, we did want to highlight a couple of things, and the Vermont model for ACT implementation out of the U.S. is, um, is an example that's documented in the literature of how Housing First uh, ACT teams can be um, implemented in rural communities, and it's essentially that. It's a regionalized response where um, staff go out uh, from a center, from a central rural community into nearby rural communities to deliver services. It also leverages telehealth um, options to uh, deliver some of the um, medical support and touch and base with clients on an ongoing basis. Uh, we've also uh, seen um, in regionalized ICM and ACT approaches. So besides the Vermont, um, there's work happening, for example, in Columbus and, uh, sorry, not in Columbus, in, in rural Ohio balanced state where um, intensive case management programs are implemented region-wide and um, Staff can be located on site in each of the communities, but um, funding and coordination um, functions happen out of one lead community. And so that bypasses some of the issues around um, scale, because some of the communities only have six or um, five families that need that response in a year, so it doesn't make sense to have one program per. So creating programs that are regionalized is, is one. Leveraging resources and programs that are already in place, so shifting um, the mandate of, a, of an outreach program, for example, to, and adding um, perhaps staff expertise or training to turn it more into uh, taking on landlord liaising and some of the system navigation case management functions. Um, this bypassing of shelter responses is, is something that 
um, has been we've seen in, for example, Steinbeck and um, Manitoba, where instead of building uh, shelter, the formal shelter responses, they they um, place people that need emergency shelter in in kind of the host program um, notion. So somebody, there's a host that living upstairs, and the the basement is. Um, um, serving as an emergency shelter. Um, we saw that in Wellington County as well, with youth in particular. Um, but we also hear of uh, rural responses that are intentionally leveraging emergency shelters in, in larger areas. So instead of building an emergency shelter in, in a small center, they, uh, you know, they will respond by um, encouraging people to migrate. And so that's you know that's one way of doing it. Another way is to um, offer people um, uh, hotel vouchers as well. So instead of building a facility, you you have this more fluid response to to that emergency need. Um, locating housing units across centers. That's something actually that we saw in the New Brunswick Chiswa adaptation. We um, we chatted with the, the team there as part of this work as well, and we um, heard about um, offering clients choice of units that were available in less costly areas of the New Brunswick region. So they might be living in a community that's higher rent, um, low vacancy, and the offer is, well, if you move to X, you're gonna, you're gonna, your rent is going to go down by this amount. So of course, there's this, there's this option of moving people around the region, and we saw that in BC and Smithers in particular um, as well. The challenge, of course, is that people may not want to move, and um, if they do move there, they might be uh, limited in terms of accessing their social support networks, and um, there's probably a good reason why there's cheap housing in that area. So uh, does it make sense to, um, to move people like that if, um, if that's not necessarily the best option for them? However, it is part of the, the response that we saw um, across Canada. Uh, telehealth options, we mentioned that in relation to Vermont, um, and I actually did mention this to, to people when I chatted with them, and some of them, oh, are you kidding? I don't even have cell reception <laughs> sometime in my, in my community. So there's this limitation of the reach of technology. I mean, where it does work, it can go, work very well, but um, you know, we don't necessarily have that, that kind of coverage across the country, so it's not going to be the be-all, end-all solution, that's for sure. Um, I mentioned the Revelstoke Smithers and uh, New Brunswick, and Jeanette talked about um, the Newfoundland communities as well. So I'll, I'll just um, touch base on one initiative that's kind of um, emerging, and that's uh, Redcliffe and, and Medicine Hat, and that's actually not in the report because it's, it's just emerging now. But this is a, um, a partnership that uh, between a, a larger city, Medicine Hat in Alberta, and Redcliffe, which is a small, small center right out, outside of Medicine Hat, and what they're looking at is creating that regionalized um, intensive case management uh, programming that targets youth that are migrating between the, the two communities. So um, again, there's this is just to show you that there are communities that are, are experimenting with, with um, adapting housing first, and there's more um, and more emerging. Um, our trick is to harness that energy and, and get people talking to each other and um, experimenting together and sharing the learnings moving forward. So this is our, our last slide, and um, I'm not sure if uh, Jeanette can, can also jump in on, on this, but um, we wanted to, of course, leave the uh, leave government who sponsored the report as, as well as you guys with some recommendations moving forward. So um, I'll start us off and then I'll, I'll ask Jeanette to, to jump in as well. Um, but the first one is just, you know, getting a clear understanding of what Housing First is as an approach and prog program type. Just what, what we said before in terms of people's understanding is varies quite a bit across the country. So if we really want um, you know, innovative work to happen, we, we have to get on the, on the same page. And, and um, a lot of the time, communities are not necessarily brought into our knowledge exchange forums, such as this webinar. Uh, people are, that don't receive HPS funds, for example, might not be, you know, on the, on the email list for, for those types of opportunities. And um, so we need to make a, a better eff effort of getting the word out on the resources available and, and getting people in these communities in on the conversation. 
the exploration of innovative housing first adaptations in, in rural communities. Again, we, uh, you know, this um, this is the beginning of, of this work, and we identified some some work happening across Canada. But you know, there's also a significant investment happening in in some communities. Um, like Alberta just issued a um, an RFP for housing first in in rural Alberta. So there's I'm guessing there's probably going to be seven or eight new pilots that are looking at this exact issue, and I'm guessing there's going to be a lot more across the country. So um, a systematic evaluation of these of these approaches and, and their learnings and um, ability to scale it up uh, would be something that we, we can consider moving forward. Um, system planning approaches to rural homelessness. So um, we talked about that regionalized um, approach that recognizes migration but doesn't see migration as the only solution. So um, we probably need to do a bit more um, theoretical and, and practical work on, on what that looks like moving forward. Um, and then, um, Jeanette, do you want to jump in on enhancing research on rural homelessness? That's probably your expertise <laughs> more so than mine. <laughs> Actually, Ali and I, I think that we're both beginning to develop uh, some expertise around that. Uh, you're being a little humble. But anyway, um, <clears throat> what we've really found in uh, in doing this study is, is that there are a lot of things we don't know about um, both the, uh, the extent of the homelessness across certain sectors and even, and just as importantly, how to rapidly develop um, some ways to address these issues. Um, and so the research really has to take place both at a system level and also at an individual level. One of the things that I'm very interested in and that relates down to the, the last um, point which is supporting the development of rural communities of practice is that um, we really don't clearly know what are the training and support issues that are needed for people who are working in rural communities in order to support them with what they're doing and how they're, they're, they're doing it. So this is, um, uh, we need more understanding and we need to also um, look at if if people are going to live in rural areas and we want to encourage people to stay in rural areas if that is their choice then how can we best support those initiatives going forward turn it back to Lena well that's perfect because I have nothing else to say <laughs> uh, yeah I guess we'll, we'll take some questions now um, let's see okay so we've got, uh, maybe I'll read this out first, Jeanette, and we can take turns. Okay. So question one from Eric. Given the challenges to Housing First, which is really about willingness to spend, is there any sense that intentional communities like Dignity Village, Opportunity Village, and Community Village in Oregon and Texas might be viable forms of community housing for the rural homeless? So I'm not actually familiar with these, the Oregon and Texas examples, um, unfortunately, Eric. Um, maybe you can just give us a, two sentences on, on what that is about or um, maybe there's another way to frame that question. Um, unless, Jeanette, do you want to take a, take a stab at that? Uh, I, I'm, I'm extremely interested in the whole notion of intentional communities. Um, but I don't know um, what kind of intentional communities these uh, um, these particular villages are um, and the extent to which they would uh, apply or be um, appealing or acceptable to homeless people across the continuum. My understanding of a lot of intentional communities is, is that they're usually built around a specific um, philosophy of life or um, organizing principle that appeals to a certain group of people. I don't know, Eric, if you can provide some further elaboration, we can certainly look at that uh, further. But um, I think that, uh, I think the first of all that what we have to start with is recognizing that um, housing first, I'm not sure that I would, would totally support your saying it's about a willingness to spend. I think housing first started um, with the, um, uh, with the recognition that um, 
people who were homeless did not need to be dictated to in terms of uh, dealing with or being in treatment for certain functional deficits in order to earn their way into housing. So if we look at housing first as really the right to people to have housing and then to worry afterwards about whatever additional supports they need to remain stably housed, um, then yeah, we're, uh, then we're going further. Um, is there further elaboration from Eric? Yeah, he's working on it. He's okay. <laughs> Well, maybe while, uh, while um, we wait, um, actually, Jeanette, one of the things I um, that wasn't mentioned that I thought was um, probably important to oh, never mind. We've got a we've got his elaboration. He says, "I'm a supporter of housing first. All of these camps are intentional housing communities considered housing first, but they are built by the homeless with supports from the community." Okay, so it's probably like a Habitat for Humanity type of model, and they are self-governing. I read that, if I may add to it, Alina, I read in there a peer component uh, to it. If they're, if, if they're built with people from the uh, homeless community, I think that one of the big pieces of the equation that we haven't really tackled yet is how to meaningfully integrate people who with lived experience of homelessness into uh, providing the solutions and to providing uh, meaningful supports within the programs that are providing solutions. So Eric, I'm really glad that you pointed that out because um, I think that that's a, uh, anything that is going to be a, a really meaningful and sustainable effort is going to have to be a wraparound that involves the home people who have shared and lived experiences of homelessness. Um, do you actually have um, an ability to give us a preview to your most recent research on comparing housing first and permanent supportive housing? Oh, you're asking me? Mm -hmm. um, actually, in, uh, in, in a uh, project that I'm just finishing off and writing the report for, I looked at four housing first programs uh, in Alberta and Ontario and then compared them against the um, uh, the Housing First um, programs that the Mental Health Commission of Canada included in their At Home Chez Soi project. And one of the things that uh, comes out quite clearly is, is that there is a model program out of Toronto uh, called HouseLink that uh, has fully integrated a peer model into its program structure and organization. And uh, they've also built in um, a, an eviction prevention, not just a strategy, but really a, a program to address um, the uh, e eviction issues where someone is at risk. Uh, and they've been able to uh, achieve a remarkably high rate of, uh, of housing stability, um, well in excess of what we're finding in the other Pathways programs. So I think there's a lot to be said for integrating peers into making all of this happen. And things that are done with people usually have a much better and more sustainable result than things that are done to people. So I'm hoping that my report will kind of push that forward. The other thing that I would like to add, and it hasn't come up in our report, but I think that one of the um, one of the overriding or macro issues that comes up in this whole study is the extent to which we as a, a society um, maintain a rural com component in our communities. We've moved in the last 100 years of being 80% uh, rural and 20% urban to having flipped that around and we're now 19% rural and 81% uh, uh, urban. Do we want to see that urban growth proportionately continue or do we want to um, support and enhance our rural communities so that we have a diverse population and we have uh, options for where people want to live? Um, I think that that's a, a federal and provincial um, issue that, uh, that the whole issue of uh, homelessness in rural areas uh, really being, brings to the forefront because it has to do with where governments are going to allocate their resources. So we have another question that's come in. Alina, do you want to take it? 
So here's um, the question. Are you aware of any rural homelessness programs and models developed specifically for youth and their specific needs? Um, so um, the, answer, the answer is like in the Canada study, um, we didn't see anything specific that was housing first. But there was quite a bit of work happening on, on youth homelessness, um, I guess, more generally. So one is the Camrose Open Door um, program in, in Alberta. And they, they have supportive housing for, uh, for rural youth um, in particular. So they're definitely one that um, has been getting quite a bit of attention um, more recently. Um, the other one that um, we saw in this study was um, out, of the well out of Wellington County and, and Guelph. So they are taking um, a more innovative response to youth homelessness um, as a region. And they're part of Eva's initiatives work on youth homelessness as well. So I w they're definitely one to watch. Um, I'm not 100% sure what programmatically that's going to end up looking like. Um, and then the last one that I do know a little bit about um, is the is the Red Cliff Medicine Hat uh, proposed approach. And again, this one's still in its infancy, but it would essentially create a intensive case management program focused on youth. So it would provide that um, youth with scattered site housing um, and rent support access, but it would also help with family reunification where appropriate. And it w what's innovative about it is that it would work between the two regions, between uh, Medicine Hat and Red Cliff. So um, recognizing that migration is a, is a factor for, for these youth, the challenge is, you know, how do you actually serve a population that between two centers and how do you create a program that's um, integrated regionally as well. So that's something I would I would look at moving forward as a, a again as, as something to learn from. Jeanette, any any thoughts from you on that one? No, that's good. Um, we've got a question here from Angela who asks what is the percentage of population that would be interested um, Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, to move out of the rural area if they were provided with long-term supportive housing within the larger city, and then what is the ratio of homeless individuals in comparison to homeless families? Well, Angela, very good questions to which I'm not sure that we can give you the definitive answers to that. I think your the first part of your question about what percent of the population would be interested in moving out of the rural area, I think actually our, our, our research suggests the opposite, that most people who live in rural areas choose to live in rural areas and that moving to the city is something they have to do out of circumstance and not out of choice. Um, so what percentage of people would choose to stay um, in a rural area, if there were supports in the rural area, again, we have absolutely no way of knowing. We've just begun to identify the fact that not everybody wants to move to the city and um, that uh, often the only reason they do is because of the services available that they can't get locally. The ratio of homeless individuals to homeless families, um, again, uh, there is a um, I don't know, Alina, whether you recall any statistics on it, but uh, it's been very difficult to ascertain um, how many people are in family units that are homeless versus how many people are individuals that are homeless. The latest that I uh, saw was about 30%, but um, of all homeless people were homeless families. Uh, but don't forget that when we're talking homeless families, we have to count each individual within that family unit as one person and not just a family unit compared to an individual unit. Uh, Alina, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, it's, what we hear in terms of the rural component is that um, people always or seem, to, seem to point to families when they talk about hidden homelessness. Um, and they point to individuals when they talk about chronic homelessness, but of course that doesn't, you know, that doesn't necessarily help us in terms of real numbers. And just like we were mentioning in the report, there's just no reliable statistics to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to even get their their baseline numbers. Never mind the demographic makeup of the population. So right. it's uh, something of an issue. Um, here's another question from Cheryl. 
Um, are there examples of successful methods of approaching key community stakeholders to educate and engage them in conversation about the importance of looking at housing first strategies? Um, maybe I'll take a stab at it and then pass it to you, Jeanette. So um, key community stakeholders, I'm, I'm guessing you're not referring to a to the already converted. So I'll, I'll focus my question on getting political buy-in at the at the rural level and landlord buy-in because I, I think those those uh, jump out at me as key challenges from the communities I've talked to. So in terms of political buy-in, first it's it's admitting you have a problem, right? So um, there's a need to demonstrate that through evidence that um, homelessness is actually a social issue in the community and it's one thing for uh, the emergency shelter to or the service providers to say that it's another one for for uh, diverse leaders from across sectors to say that so building bridges with uh, private sector leaders and faith leaders faith community leaders and approaching uh, politicians as a coalition um, is something that has worked well and it was a coalition that doesn't blame it's a coalition about solutions and making the community better for everyone. So if there's a way to gather real numbers on the issue, if there's a way to make a, uh, an argument from a client and community and cost savings perspective on addressing homelessness and presenting um, leadership with a plan for how to do that based on um, best practices and evidence-based practices, then I think you, you get much further along. And then being able to um, articulate how your vision um, meets their vision. So, um, what do they get out of helping you, right? So, you know, let's take an example of a, of a small community in BC. I was just visiting. Um, their um, their leadership is not necessarily on board, but that what they are concerned about is um, a significant number of uh, rough sleepers from nearby Aboriginal communities in, in their city's main park, which is right across from their mall. So, you know, the public pressure on politicians in that area is coming from that, uh, that eyesore quote. People are, are drinking in that area, etc. Well, the, the argument from, from the coalition of providers and their allies would be, if you end homelessness here, you know, that that visible form is, is not going to be there the way it is today. So finding that common ground and, and again, not coming in with blaming and thou shalt, but, you know, this is our community and you have something to gain from it and, and so so does everybody else. It's something that I've seen work. Um, I've also seen really great initiatives, and I mentioned Steinbeck before, but I'll mention them again because they're, they're a community that actually leveraged um, fully from um, private donations and volunteer efforts. So there was no government money in this, but they recognized they had uh, people sleeping rough and they um, they actually came together as a, as a community of concerned citizens uh, and came up with this host emergency shelter program that they, they fully operated as, as volunteers and um, with donations of about $50,000 per year. So that's one example that stands out for me. Um, that coalition then approached um, their main landlord in the community and asked whether they would be willing to put up a certain percentage of their units um, on a yearly basis for people that are coming out of that shelter program so that there would be a continuum um, for them into, and back into permanent housing. And so that landlord stepped up and said, yes, the units are cheap enough that uh, people on income support or uh, welfare social uh, payments can afford them. And then that landlord turned around and challenged their fellow landlords to do the same. So that's a community that didn't benefit from uh, significant provincial or, or federal investment. They're not, they're not getting HPS funds, for example, but has managed to um, do that, building these alliances and um, between key stakeholders. And so that same principle around, um, you know, making a, a sales pitch to these other stakeholders um, works for the land, on the landlord segment as well. So again, not always, but what is, uh, in, especially in economic ups and downs, the rental market sees um, vacancies skyrocket and they see lots of flow through and that, that means money and effort for the landlord. So if there was a way to master lease um, a certain number of units within uh, within buildings or within a portfolio from a particular landlord that, that was on board, 
what the program would guarantee is essentially, well, you're always going to get your rent because the agency is going to pay your rent. And if there's issues, we have case managers that are going to intervene and, and be that liaison for you because you are taking on clients that are, you know, not going to be your run-of-the-mill tenants necessarily. So there's, there's got to be a way where um, service providers can show um, benefits to, to the landlord in, in coming on board. And then if you get your foot in the door and you do well, then, you know, these, these things resolve on their own and, and work gets around that um, this is a good program and, and other landlords will, will follow suit. Um, plus, I mean, it's the right thing to do and people want to be given the opportunity to do the right thing, especially when it's economically beneficial for them as well. So, um, Jeanette, any? Uh, no, I, I, I think that's great. I have nothing else to add. I'll go on to the question from uh, sure. Terry Lee. Um, and uh, so the question is, is through your research, were you able to find a, any community in a rural area that had developed a tool to capture the number of homeless people found in their communities, specifically the rural communities that lacked shelters? Well, it, it's interesting, Terry Lee. I'm not sure if you're talking about a tool or you're talking about some kind of methodology or approach to how to enumerate um, rural homeless people. Um, it's really tough. The thing that we heard uh, quite a number of times was that um, rural in rural communities, homeless people can be um, couch surfing, they can be doubled up, they can be staying in, as I said earlier, in, in uh, unacceptable accommodation. But above and over everything, uh, people preserve and want their privacy, so they try to stay hidden. So they're more, even more hidden in rural communities, and it almost would have to be, um, especially in the the small and very remote and scattered areas, a snowball effort. I think to actually ask people if they know who might be, you know, having housing uh, struggles. In, uh, and so I don't think there's, there is no methodology that's been developed. I think that uh, we're still at the stage of having people recognize that there is an issue before trying to figure out how uh, best to capture the extent of that issue in their uh, communities. So uh, anyway, Alina, do you want to add anything to that? I think it's, it's a great question because we're struggling also with the whole issue of how do you actually get a count on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, again, the good and bad news. The good news is um, there there are communities internationally that are doing a regular homeless count in rural areas. So that means that they've developed tools and tested tools or methodologies, I should say, um, an accompanying, I guess, form um, to capture that population. There's always um, concern about the reliability of these counts. They're usually done as point in time counts. So here, you know, here's what I know. Um, I know that HUD in the U.S. Housing and Urban Development has mandated counts in all of uh, U.S. jurisdictions that receive federal dollars, and a lot of these jurisdictions, well, you know, anything outside of urban area is obviously rural, and that includes, you know, border towns, you know, Alaska, you know, so all types of rural communities have to do counts. When we look at promising approaches to those counts, um, there's strategies that help address some of the issues that we encounter in rural areas, such as the hiddenness of the issue and et cetera. So there's good learnings coming out of the U.S. because they've been mandated to do this, um, I, I think, about a decade ago. So there's that. There's also talk about creating a national um, count for Canada as well um, based on uh, reviews of promising approaches um, in Canada and U.S. and um, Europe and Australia. So that work is definitely percolating in, uh, in the country as well. And there's certainly been some mm -hmm. efforts in sporadically in communities that, that we can learn from. Um, but what I've seen is, is generally just smaller communities as opposed to rural communities per se. So um, all that being said, um, major issue, but there are solutions we can learn from. And um, maybe what I'll do is send the best practice um, document from HUD um, to the uh, to the Homeless Hub and then have them post it as a resource for, for you if you're interested in finding out more about how this is done in other jurisdictions. 
So we've got um, okay. Let's see. Last question from Nick. In urban communities, the economic argument for investing in housing and homelessness services is quite strong, um, given the costs associated with emergency institutional services. In rural communities, where the services are fewer, is the economic argument still relevant? And if so, is it still being used to ad advocate for housing with policymakers and funders? All right. Um, who, Jeanette, did you want to take this one? Um, it, it, well, it's interesting. I think we can both have some uh, comments on this. Um, the One of the problems with uh, the um, advocating in rural communities is, is that you don't, you, the, the sheer numbers not, are not there as they are in, um, in urban areas. Um, and so it's harder to make an argument when you have fewer people. Um, a lot of the argument has to be made on uh, the whole notion of civil society and what we accept as if it is reasonable to accept a certain standard of living in urban areas then it, it needs to be equally applicable in rural areas. Um, it doesn't have quite the same weight in terms of dollars and cents uh, as it does in urban areas. Um, and yet, nevertheless, I think that as a society, we need to look at if we're going to support a rural population, then we have to be willing to put the funding into the rural population. Alina? Um, yeah, a couple of things come to mind. So in, in terms of definitive research on this issue, the New Brunswick um, implementation of CHESWA, which was a housing first implementation that I'm sure you guys are familiar with through Mental Health Commission of Canada. Um, that was looking at cost savings in, uh, in a rural context and so and that actually reaffirmed the cost argument can still hold in a rural context. So that's, so that's kind of the good news. Um, however, from what I saw in that study, it was um, it wasn't significantly lower, um, but it was it was a lower saving than you than we saw in the major urban centers like um, Vancouver. So um, so it's there, and maybe I'll I'll send that as well because I, I mentioned it. If you're if you're looking at specifics on on cost savings in rural implementation, um, so I think that argument still holds, um, but and, you know you got to put some asterisks around it. The other way I would make the argument around that is that the rural population is migrating into the urban center, so um, you know you're you're necessarily investing in, in kind of these regionalized prevention efforts by by addressing the issue before it it shows up on the doorstep of your urban emergency shelter, right? So yeah, you're going to pay for it one way or another um, by investing in, in rural communities earlier. You might be able to mitigate some of the long-term um, struggles people have when they do migrate because migration, especially to access emergency services, is, is quite disruptive and it, it removes it makes the situation worse, and especially for people that are vulnerable. So um, you know, a regionalized response and actually mitigate some of the impacts of this issue in, in urban centers as well. So the cost saving is not just for the rural community, but also for the broader um, broader region as well. Um, and I, that, I think, was our last question. So um, I guess we want to thank everybody. These were wonderful, um, very insightful questions, and it made us think um, pretty hard for right before uh, lunch for us here. Um, and uh, thank you very much to the Homeless Hub for organizing a, such a wonderful event and for the tweet chat yesterday and the launch of their report. Um, it's available online on Homeless Hub's uh, main site as well. Uh, and I want to thank yeah, I do. I, I want to thank everyone for uh, for partic participating, and thank you so much for some of those really excellent questions. I think it gives us some additional thinking uh, space and uh, places to take the research forward. So please stay in touch and please contact us individually if you have further questions. Our email uh, addresses uh, are on the contact information, and I hope everyone has a good, safe, and warm rest of uh, July 9th. Bye for now. Bye.